Ever since their original appearance within Final Fantasy III, summons have become famed parts of the Final Fantasy franchise. Part of this has been due to the awesome spectacle brought forth whenever they are called upon, but they have also provided the player with the potential for huge amounts of damage and unique utility, and in the latter sense, few would be as recognisable as Odin. From day one, whereas the majority of summons would be useful due to their elemental affinities or high damage output, Odin would stride in upon his trusty steed to provide something different, the ability to defeat enemies in an instant. That function would persist as the franchise developed, as would the connection between Odin and Sleipnir. But numerous other traits would also be introduced, and throughout this video, we're going to take you on an expansive journey where we'll explore how every single appearance of Odin has tied together to create one of the most dominating and powerful summons to have ever been associated with Final Fantasy. Odin is a well-known figure within Norse mythology. The father of prominent figures such as Thor and Loki, Odin is portrayed as someone who has a relentless pursuit of knowledge and dominance when it comes to all things war. He would be depicted as a tall, bearded man with one eye, and he would ride Sleipnir, an eight-legged horse famed for its speed and ability to travel across not just land, but also sea and air. When engaged in combat, Odin's weapon of choice would be a powerful spear named Gungnir, said to never miss its target, but he would also be associated with a sword called Gram. Within Dungeons & Dragons, Odin would first appear in the Greyhawk supplement, with further context being added as Dungeons & Dragons grew out. Within this particular lore, Odin would also be associated with Sleipnir, a staff assumed to be Gungnir, and Gram, dubbed Odin's sword that would be wielded by Sigurd. But when Odin appeared within Final Fantasy III, even though some of these unique traits would be apparent, plenty of original traits would be overlaid to create a unique interpretation of the Norse god. Odin could first be encountered within the Saronia Catacombs, an optional dungeon found underwater. Within, players had the chance to square off against Odin, who had been deep in slumber, and it would be through this encounter that they would see some pretty noticeable changes in comparison to lore established elsewhere. Odin would stand off against the party wearing a full set of silver armour, complete with an elaborate cape and horned helm. Both would have red accents, and that colour theme would extend through to Odin's shield and the hilt of his curved sword. Odin would also be riding atop Sleipnir, but unlike in Norse mythology, where his trusty steed would have eight legs, within Final Fantasy III, Sleipnir only had four. The encounter, assuming players were not speedy, also had the potential to come to a swift conclusion if Odin was allowed to use Zantetsuken. In Japanese, this would translate to Iron Severing Sword, and it would be a very pointed and accurate description, as Zantetsuken could deal incredible amounts of damage. Odin would also have a reference back to weaponry spoken about within mythology, as Gungnir could also be stolen during the encounter. It could then be equipped by Dragoons and Onion Knights after the encounter had concluded. With Odin defeated, the player would then be able to call upon his strength, and this would come in three forms. Evokers would have access to lesser spells. Protective Light would serve as the defensive variant, casting Reflect on allies, and Slash would deal non-elemental damage to a single target. Summoners and Sages would then gain access to a spell that justified Odin's classification as a high-tier summon, as Zantetsuken would deliver an instant KO to susceptible enemies. Within the original iteration of Final Fantasy III, this would have a 50% chance of landing, but within the 3D remake and the Pixel Remaster versions, this percentage chance would be removed. In Final Fantasy IV, the status of Odin was promoted within the narrative. Towards the latter part of the game, players would be able to venture into the depths of Baron Castle, and in the dungeon, they would find the real King of Baron. It was at this moment that the King of Baron would reveal himself to be Odin, and sensing Rydia, Odin would challenge the party. The encounter would be very similar to what was seen within Final Fantasy III. 
Not only would the visual design be near identical, albeit with the colour highlights changed from red to blue, Odin would utilise Zantetsuken after a period of time to deal huge damage to the party. The major difference would be that Gongnir could no longer be stolen, as it would instead be auto-equipped to Kane when he returned to the party after the battle against the Giant of Babel. After the fight, Odin would then be summonable, but only by Rydia, and the functionality would be retained, as it would grant access to Zantetsuken, a powerful ability that would deliver an instant KO to all susceptible enemies. Odin would next appear within Final Fantasy V, and even though his role was reduced, there were some significant evolutions. Odin could be found within the basement of Castle Baal, which continued the theme of Odin residing within the depths of fortified structures. And it would be here that players could choose to challenge the fearsome warrior who had been slumbering for some time. As with the two previous challenges, Odin would need to be defeated with great haste in order to avoid defeat. But this time, there was a specific time limit attached, and if Odin was not defeated within the time, the player would lose and suffer a game over. As soon as the fight commenced, players would get to see an Odin who bore resemblance to the previous two iterations, but there was also a very different visual style. It would see Odin wear a shiny suit of armour that was now gold as opposed to silver, and the red cape was retained, but outside of that, other colour highlights were removed. Odin also continued to wield a sword, but it was now far less curved, and the shield was ditched, perhaps to emphasise how strong Odin believed he was. The other major visual change came via Odin's horse, as it now had six legs as opposed to four. Beyond that, from a gameplay perspective, Odin was aligned with Holy, absorbing all damage, but he would drop the flame shield, and when summoned, the Holy alignment would be removed. Zantetsuken would return as Odin's primary move, used to deliver an instant KO to susceptible enemies. But unlike the two previous games, Odin also had a backup move. If there were no susceptible enemies, this would see Odin make use of Gungnir to deliver an attack of great power to a single target. And with the two abilities combined, Odin would continue to be classified as a high tier summon. By Final Fantasy VI, Odin had been established as one of the core summons associated with the franchise. This had been achieved despite the acquisition of Odin being an optional venture in each prior iteration, and as espers were elevated in status within the narrative of Final Fantasy VI, so too was the status of Odin. During the War of the Magi, Odin was a renowned warrior. He was employed in the service of an unknown human faction and fought valiantly to protect them when their castle was invaded. Due to the power that Odin wielded, no soldiers were able to break his defensive line, and in the end, this led to a sorcerer petrifying Odin on the steps of the throne room. Fast forward a thousand years, and the remains of Odin could be found within that ancient castle, and with so much time having passed, his essence had become stored within a magicite shard. Unlike every prior game, this meant even though the acquisition of Odin was still optional, fighting against Odin was not required. And to push things even further, should the player stumble upon a nearby hidden passage to find the petrified form of the queen Odin was trying so hard to protect, Odin's Magicite Shard could be upgraded, allowing him to become Raiden. Due to this, Odin was relegated to being a mid-tier Esper, and it meant that even though Zantetsuken still had the ability to inflict instant KO, the chance of it working was reduced to only 25%. To gain the maximum effect, players would need to use Raiden. Instead of wielding Zantetsuken, Raiden would use Shin Zantetsuken, and the percentage chance of landing would be much greater. Both moves, should they fail, would also have backup functionality, as they could stall the final attacks of strong enemies for one turn. The other interesting element in Final Fantasy VI related to Odin's visual style. This would see Odin feature a near-identical appearance to what was seen within Final Fantasy IV, just with more fidelity. This meant the shield returned, and Slugnir was reduced to only having four legs. The only major difference was that Odin was now left-handed. Raiden would then sport a very similar design, but the horned helm would be removed, as would the shield. By this point in the franchise, there had been four iterations of Odin, 
But whereas clear similarities could be seen between the Odin that appeared in Final Fantasy 3, 4 and 6, the Odin that appeared within Final Fantasy 5 was quite unique by comparison. And when work commenced on Final Fantasy 7, the developers chose to use that unique variation as a base for their efforts. From a visual perspective, this meant Odin would see the shield removed and Sleipnir would have six legs as opposed to four. But perhaps the biggest link between the two iterations was what Odin would do when summoned. Odin's default ability would be Zantetsuken, which would deliver an instant KO with a 92% hit rate. But just like in Final Fantasy V, if the enemy was immune, Odin would instead use Gunge Lance to deal non-elemental damage. It meant Odin would still have utility, However, due to the inclusion of summons such as Bahamut Zero and Knights of the Round, the position of Odin within the pecking order was quite low. Despite the strong association with Final Fantasy V, the method of acquiring Odin would instead be more in line with Final Fantasy VI. And this was because even though a boss would need to be fought, the player did not need to fight Odin. Instead, Odin was a reward for defeating Lost Number, an enemy hiding within the Nibelheim mansion. Odin would next appear within Final Fantasy Tactics as one of the many summons available to those utilising the summoner job. It could be learnt by spending JP, and when summoned, players would see a design that was very reminiscent of Final Fantasy V and VII, as Odin had no shield and Sleipnir had six legs. The major evolution here though was that Odin did not perform Zantetsuken. Perhaps because it would have been deemed too powerful, Odin would instead perform a non-elemental slash, just like in Final Fantasy III. And due to its relative power, this very much placed Odin as a mid-tier summon. Now, due to its nature as a Japanese exclusive spin-off, it would be very easy to overlook the appearance of Odin within Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon. However, even though it was, for the most part, quite derivative, as Odin would perform Zantetsuken when summoned, there were some crucial visual evolutions. In every previous game, when Odin used a shield, Sleipnir would have four legs, and whenever he didn't, Sleipnir would have six legs. Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon broke the mold, as Sleipnir had six legs and Odin used a shield. Beyond that, Odin also had blue armour, and there was another first, as the armour was not all-encompassing. There were gaps, and this meant we got to see Odin's upper arm. Chocobo's Dungeon 2 would use the same visual design for Odin, but this time Zantetsuken was removed. Instead, Odin dealt non-elemental damage through Gungnir and a new ability called Fenris Bane. Final Fantasy VIII featured a range of brand new summons, but there was also room for a few old favourites, and it saw Odin appear alongside the likes of Ifrit, Shiva and Bahamut. And perhaps due to its role as a venerable summon, Odin was given a small role within the narrative. Referring back to Final Fantasy 3 through 6, this saw Odin connected with an old mystical place called the Centra Ruins. Players would also need to fight Odin in order to prove their worth. However, even though the trial served as a subtle nod back to Final Fantasy 5, it was now much more grandiose. One of the unique aspects of the encounter in Final Fantasy V was the timer. Odin would sit there and take damage without any kind of response, but when the timer ended, it was game over. This was elevated by the entire Centra Ruins dungeon having a timer. It would see players given 20 minutes to navigate their way through the dungeon, with the player also needing to defeat Odin within the time limit. During the encounter, Odin would strike an imposing figure, and the design served as an homage back to Final Fantasy V and VII. However, just as in Final Fantasy V, Odin would not take any action until the timer expired, at which point he would use Zantetsuken and players would end up staring at a game over screen. But if the player was successful, then they would bear witness to another evolution. Unlike every previous iteration, this would see players have no control over when Odin would come to their aid. Instead, Odin would appear at random to perform Zantetsuken and deal an instant KO. The only exceptions would be if the player was fighting a boss, a Tombri, or a Cactor, as Odin would not appear within these encounters. The only time this would not be the case was if Odin had been acquired before fighting against Cypher within the Lunatic Pandora, as another trait would surface, albeit in a different manner. 
During the encounter, Odin would be scripted to appear, but instead of showing his combat prowess and annihilating Cypher, Zantetsuken would be countered and Odin would be slain. Gilgamesh would then appear to take its place, serving as an upgrade of sorts, as in addition to being able to perform Zantetsuken, Gilgamesh had two other useful damage dealing abilities for when enemies were not susceptible to the instant KO. Final Fantasy IX would have a huge focus on summons. It would see them play a pivotal role within the story, and their power was on full display throughout. This increased focus would serve to benefit Odin, as for the second game running, it would appear within a major set piece moment. But unlike Final Fantasy VIII, where Odin showed up only to be smited down, in Final Fantasy IX, Odin was wielded as a weapon of mass destruction, called upon by Queen Braun to decimate Clara. This sequence was pretty incredible, especially as the player wouldn't have had access to Odin at the time, but they would have seen reference to Odin as he was a summon associated with Garnet. It's just that, because her latent powers had not yet activated, she would not have enough MP to call Odin forth. Due to this, Final Fantasy IX represented the first instance where Odin was technically not optional, as it was accessible to Garnet. However, after her powers awakened, regaining access to Odin would be optional, as it would need to be purchased via the auction house within Trino. When called forth, players would see an interesting twist on Final Fantasy V. This meant Sleipnir would have six legs and no shield. However, instead of having a curved sword, Odin now wielded a huge great sword, and his armor had a skeletal motif. The other interesting twist would relate to Odin from a gameplay perspective. In the full summon sequence, Odin would perform Zantetsuken, delivering an instant KO. However, within the shortened animation sequence, Odin would instead use Gungnir, no doubt a reference to the Clarin Decimation, where Odin used his trusty spear. However, unlike in previous games, Gungnir did not deliver non-elemental damage, instead delivering the exact same function as Zantetsuken. The inclusion of Odin within the narrative continued in Final Fantasy XI, as he appeared as one of the eight sleeping gods known as Avatars. Within the lore, Odin was once known as the Dark Divinity, and he had become embroiled in a long-standing conflict against Alexander. As time passed, Odin decided to grant his power only to those he deemed worthy, a nod to the long-standing trait of players needing to prove their might to acquire Odin, and this saw him aligned with characters such as the Shadow Lord and Lady Lilith, two prominent antagonists. Beyond that, Odin would also appoint a servant who would act as a manifestation of Odin. For a long time, even though players could fight against Odin Prime, he would not be made summonable upon being defeated. The encounter itself would also be unique in another regard too, as Odin would wield Gongnir, would have no shield, and Sleipnir would have only four legs. Odin would also make use of a new suite of moves such as Gangrath, Gyroth, and Sangatal, and each would add status effects such as Terror. In 2010, Odin would then be made accessible to High Summoners. When under Astral Flow, this would grant summoners access to Zantetsuken, using a summoner's entire MP pool for a chance to deliver an instant KO to all opposing enemies. Against notorious monsters, this would then be changed to deal high levels of non-elemental damage. The other interesting aspect here was that during Dynamis, disjointed zone bosses could call forth disjointed Odin. And instead of using Zantetsuken as its ultimate ability, disjointed Odin would wield Shin Zantetsuken, not seen since Final Fantasy VI, where it was wielded by Raiden, Shin Zantetsuken within Final Fantasy XI would cause instant death, and it would also deactivate re-raise status for any characters who were under the effect. The next appearance of Odin came within Final Fantasy Tactics Advance. However, unlike its predecessor, Odin was no longer against the roster of available summons. Instead, Odin was only referenced within a quest, and the reward for the quest would be Odin's Lance. Final Fantasy XII would take a similar approach, as Odin was again not amongst the roster of available summons. This time, Odin would be mentioned within an intelligence report, with Alcid Margrace noting that Odin was an airship in the first fleet of the Imperial Army. This all meant that the next physical appearance of Odin would be in Final Fantasy XII Revenant Wings. 
Available to the player after the completion of Mission 24, Odin could be purchased from the Ring of Pact and it will be classified as a high tier non-elemental physical damage summon. When called upon, Odin would use Zantetsuken. However, instead of dealing an instant KO to opposing enemies, it would deal non-elemental damage. The only unique aspect was that, perhaps as a throwback to Final Fantasy VI where Odin could be used to delay the turn of strong enemies, within Revenant Wings, Zantetsuken had knockback. The other connection to Final Fantasy VI would come from Odin's visual design. On the surface, there would be almost nothing in common between the two games, as Ryoma Ito delivered a very elaborate interpretation of the Venerable Summon. But those with an eagle eye would have noticed that Odin was left-handed, a trait previously only seen in Final Fantasy VI. In Crisis Core, Odin was amongst a small selection of summons chosen to be part of the DMW system. To obtain Odin, players would need to complete mission 816, and after doing so, they would gain access to the summon. However, much like in Final Fantasy VIII, players could not choose when to summon Odin. It would instead be random based upon the whims of the DMW system. If lucky enough, Odin would come to Zack's aid, using Zantetsuken to deliver an instant KO. Acting as a huge tribute to the franchise, the city of Final Fantasy featured a whole host of summons. But instead of being new creations, the developers chose to pay tribute to previous iterations. In the case of Odin, this saw the Final Fantasy VI version appear as well as the Crisis Core version. This would be quite interesting, especially as Crisis Core was so recent, but they would represent the two sides of Odin, as one would have a shield and a four-legged Sleipnir, and the other would have no shield and a six-legged Sleipnir. When used, Odin would perform Zantetsuken, and this would have a 50% chance of performing a break on the opponent's bravery points. The same function would then resurface within Dissidia, Duodecim. Between the release of Final Fantasy IX and Final Fantasy XIII, Odin had taken some time away from the spotlight. The once proud and venerable summon had been relegated from set-piece moments like the decimation of Clara down to simply being mentioned within intelligence reports. And in more and more games, Odin was being cut from the roster, with Final Fantasy X being a prime example. The only exception would be Final Fantasy XI, and Final Fantasy XIII built upon that to provide one of the most comprehensive iterations of Odin we'd ever seen. It would see Odin aligned with Lightning, the poster child for Final Fantasy XIII, and this would have a huge impact on not just the narrative, but also gameplay. Odin would appear within the story when Lightning's resolve needed to be tested, Frustrated by Hope, this saw Lightning inadvertently summon Odin, who then proceeded to attack Hope, as so to rid her of this burden. Once Odin was defeated and the test had been overcome, Lightning would henceforth be able to call upon the summon to aid her in battle. This passage would be an allusion to how Odin would often be acquired, but it was not unique, as each other character would go through a similar passage of play in relation to their own unique summon. That being said, almost everything else relating to Odin was quite unique. Perhaps the most notable deviation was that Odin no longer rode Sleipnir, as Odin was Sleipnir. This was possible due to Odin having two distinct modes, Normal Mode and Gestalt Mode. In Normal Mode, Odin would appear with a modernized design that would feature all the hallmarks, a horned helm, curved sword and shield. There would also be an association with the colour green which had not been seen since the early days of the franchise. This would be the mode encountered when squaring off against Odin, but it would also be the default summoning mode. And due to how much summons had evolved since Odin was last in a prominent role, this was where we saw a significant evolution in the array of moves available to Odin. In his normal form, this would see Odin able to use moves such as Flourish of Steel, an evolved version of Slash as well as Skyward Swing, Crushing Blow, and other Shield. This moveset would also see Odin aligned with an element, something that had seldom happened before, as quite often, Odin was a non-elemental summon. Here though, Odin was aligned with the Lightning or Thunder element. Odin could also enter into Gestalt mode. Not quite an upgrade in the traditional sense, but outside of Odin transforming into a rideable ally, a horse with four legs, it would grant Lightning access to a higher tier of abilities, and the most important of these would be Zantetsuken. Like many previous games, this would deliver an instant KO. 
But the caveat here, outside of some enemies being immune, was that its probability of killing the enemy would be based on attack power and chain bonus. And if the instant KO failed, Zantetsuken would then deliver damage instead. Odin would then appear within Final Fantasy XIII 2 as an ally for Lightning. This would be very derivative, but there was one big evolution scene, as within Final Fantasy XIII 2 we saw the first variant of Odin appear in the form of Twilight Odin. Twilight Odin featured a distinct colour palette and could be fought numerous times in the Vile Peaks. It was again lightning based and in the second encounter could use Zantetsuken against the party. Odin would then reappear within Lightning Returns, but although the classic visual would be seen throughout the story, the main evolution here was that Odin appeared as something else, a chocobo called the Angel of Valhalla. The next appearance for Odin came in Final Fantasy Dimensions, and it was very faithful. Odin could be found within the King's Castle, a trait not seen for some time, and to obtain the power of Odin he would need to be defeated in combat. The battle itself would serve as an allusion to how Odin was obtained within Final Fantasy V, as there would even be a countdown involved. Odin would also make use of Gungnir alongside Zantetsuken, and they could both be utilised by the player when summoning Odin. But even though the allusion to Final Fantasy V was clear from a mechanical perspective, from a visual perspective, Odin was more reminiscent of what was seen within Final Fantasy IV and VI, and this meant Odin would be holding a shield, and Sleipnir would only have four legs. Now Odin did not appear within the original incarnation of Final Fantasy XIV, but was added as part of A Realm Reborn. Much like in Final Fantasy XI, this would see Odin as an encounterable foe, with the initial instance being via a fate known as Steel Rain, and then a trial known as Earth's Fount. During the fate, Odin would make use of a quintessential set of moves such as Gungnir and Zantetsuken, the latter would again make reference back to Final Fantasy V, as Zantetsuken was given a lengthy 30 second cast time, and if Odin was not defeated before then, those participating in the fate would be felled in an instant. Alongside those two moves, Odin would make use of some other unique entries such as Einhajar and Valknut, and they would both be references back to Norse mythology. Within the trial, as found, Odin would be given an expanded move set. This would include abilities such as Sangatal and Gungrath, which had been associated with Odin in Final Fantasy XI, but the main event was an upgrade to Zantetsuken. Shin Zantetsuken had not been seen for some time, but here the application differed. Much like the regular Zantetsuken, Odin would start to cast this ability when it either had 15% health remaining, or there were 6 minutes remaining within the encounter. Odin would then need to be defeated before the cast time had finished, or they would eat 99,999 damage. The other interesting aspects related to this particular iteration of Odin were the lore and appearance. There were similarities with Final Fantasy XI here, as Odin was created as a roaming primal. This meant Odin could possess the bodies of mortals, transforming them into a manifestation of himself, similar to how Odin in Final Fantasy XI could designate a servant who would embody its form and make use of its abilities. Where Odin differed from Final Fantasy XI was with its appearance, as the curved sword returned, as did the shield. Final Fantasy Record Keeper had a heavy emphasis on nostalgia. This meant the developers pulled in references to the entire franchise, and amongst those references was Odin. But not just one Odin, as Record Keeper featured numerous iterations. In the most basic sense, Odin would be wielded as a rank 5 summon by specific characters. And when summoned, Odin would use Zantetsuken to deliver an instant KO with the move delivering non-elemental damage and defensive buffs should the target be immune. Outside of that, there will be references to almost every major instance of Odin to have appeared within a mainline game, but there were also some interesting twists here as we got to see some variants. The only previous time an Odin variant had been seen would be in 13.2, but Record Keeper took this further by featuring Dark Odin as well as Light Odin. In Final Fantasy Explorers, Odin would appear as one of the bosses that needed defeating. When encountered, players would see a traditional design. This would see Odin wield a curved sword and he would wear a horned helm, but there was no shield, and as tradition had dictated, this meant Sleipnir would have six legs. The encounter itself would be quite tricky due to Odin using Zantetsuken, which would have a possibility of delivering an instant KO to all player characters. After the fight, players would then be able to wield this themselves via the Crystal Surge mechanic, 
However, its application would be changed as the instant KO function was removed in favour of delivering high levels of non-elemental damage. Odin would next appear within Final Fantasy Dimensions 2 and we would see a very interesting twist. Throughout much of the franchise, Odin had been classified as a non-elemental summon. There have been a few exceptions to this, with one of the most prominent examples being Odin's association with Thunder in Final Fantasy XIII. But in Dimensions 2, Odin was associated with the Wind Element. Odin would have the closest alignment with Parai. This would grant access to Zantetsuken, which would deal wind damage to all enemies and would grant a chance to deliver an instant KO. This would not be the only ability though, as Odin also granted access to Foolish Mist. This would resurface Odin's association with debuffing, as it would decrease enemy attack, magic and speed. Dark Odin would also appear associated with Minor. Much like Odin, Dark Odin would be aligned with the Wind Element, but instead of granting access to Zantetsuken, Dark Odin would use Goku Zantetsuken. This would be an enhanced version of Zantetsuken that would hit three times instead of one. Beyond this, we would also see another version of Odin featured called Odin Omega, and each of these variants would use four initial designs as a base. It meant we'd see two variants of Odin without a shield and Sleipnir with six legs, one variant where Odin had a shield and Sleipnir had four legs, and one variant where Odin wouldn't have a shield, Sleipnir wouldn't have four legs, and Odin was also left-handed, a trait seldom seen. Mobius would take a similar approach to Record Keeper, featuring a whole host of Odin variants from across the franchise. It would see Odin have numerous elemental associations, including wind, light, and dark. We would also see Extreme Odin and Extreme Odin X feature appearing as variants of Odin from Final Fantasy XIII. But perhaps the most intriguing aspect of Mobius, outside of the doubling down on Odin as a wind elemental summon, was that the association with Zantetsuken and Odin was almost unilaterally ditched. The only exception to this was when facing Odin as part of the Odin the Gale quest, but the same could also be said for Yojimbo and Gilgamesh, who also wielded Zantetsuken as part of events where they too could be fought. The appearance of Odin within Brave Exodus would serve as a nice allusion back to the 8-bit and 16-bit eras. It would see Odin appear as an optional acquisition that could be found inside an old castle, and there was even some lore relating to the power Odin wielded in times gone by. After being acquired, players would gain access to three summon abilities, Gungnir, Zantetsuken, and Shin Zantetsuken. They would each deal non-elemental damage, with the Zantetsuken variants also having a chance of inflicting an instant KO, and Shin Zantetsuken increasing the probability. For Dissidia NT, it was decided that Odin should make an appearance as one of the seven summons players could call upon during encounters. Due to the nature of the experience, this would see quite a few elements pulled in, but the implementation would be adapted. It would see, for example, Odin summon spears that could rain down from the sky, and the finishing move, Zantetsuken, would deal huge damage. The main bonus though, would be that Odin would buff speed and dash due to the connection with Sleipnir. When fighting against Odin, he would use Gungnir as well as a suite of unique moves, and many of these would carry over for Odin's appearance within Opera Omnia. In World of Final Fantasy, Odin appeared as one of Pleiad 7. He could be fought in an option encounter, and then acquired upon its completion. What made this particular iteration interesting was that despite being a tribute game, Odin had a very bespoke design. And one of the main elements that made the design stand out was that Odin not only wielded Gongnir as opposed to a curved sword, something that had only ever happened before in Final Fantasy XI, but he also had a shield. During the encounter, Odin would only make use of a few abilities, but they were classics, with Gongnir and Zantetsuken being the two most prominent. When acquired, players would gain access to those abilities, but they would also gain access to another ability called Ur's Shield, a move previously seen within Final Fantasy XIII. In more recent times, Odin has appeared within Brave Exvius War of the Visions. For this particular iteration, Odin would have the less common appearance of wielding a shield and Sleipnir having six legs, and the ability would also be less common, as Zantetsuken would deal non-elemental damage while increasing the critical rate for allies for three turns. And that then brings us to Final Fantasy XVI, where Odin has been revealed as one of the summons that will appear within the main game. 
From what we've seen, Odin will have a far more aggressive appearance, featuring no shield and a six-legged Sleipnir, and it has also been aligned with the dark element as opposed to either thunder or wind. But for everything else, it will be best to wait until the final product releases to understand the specific points of reference from the wider franchise. All things considered though, when looking back it's very interesting to see how Odin has evolved. There are two distinct visual styles, with one featuring a shield bearing Odin and a four legged Sleipnir, and the other featuring a shieldless Odin and a six legged Sleipnir. Other variations have seen Odin wield Gongnir, and there have been a few instances where Odin is even left handed. Outside of that, Zandetsugan has been the primary focus, with Gongnir very much the secondary focus. Each has its core utility, and although there have been variations and upgrades on these concepts, they have largely remained the same. A few other abilities have also been introduced, but they have seldom stuck, and it means that often with Odin, what you see is what you get. That notion should be challenged ever so slightly with Final Fantasy XVI, as we know Clive will wield an expanded array of abilities, and it certainly will be interesting to see how the 7 remake chooses to tackle Odin when he eventually appears. Either way, if you enjoyed this video, please give us a like, and as always, be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Feel free to also give suggestions about what you'd like us to tackle next within a future evolutionary study. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, Chris M. Walker, The Livestream, Elsa Claire Farron, Gaussin Dikajata, Gregory, Justin Dent, Lord of Morning, and Zukan TDK, who are super special Onionite supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.